Okay, so um, I'm David Thorpe. I'm director of the One Planet Center. I'm based in Carmarthenshire. And what I'm going to talk about is One Planet thinking, One Planet development, um, One Planet strategies. And what do we mean by One Planet? Um, so basically, as you're probably aware, all around the world, there are lots of fantastic ecological projects happening. My question is always, how can we be sure that they're up to the challenge and that the benefits that they're hopefully gaining are not being cancelled out by other activities going on in the same place or somewhere else. And that to me is a huge challenge we face because we know that uh, renewable energy is being installed at an increasing pace, for instance, and yet so is energy demand going up and the amount of fossil fuel installation is going up as well. So the way to begin is to think about the fact that the earth has only so many resources to go around and we have to share them equally, not only amongst ourselves, but with all other living things on the planet for our sake and for their sake. And we've been living in ecological deficit for 50 years. In other words, we've been living off the future. The green line on this graph shows uh, the basic biocapacity of the planet and the rising line shows how we crossed what the planet can provide about 1971-72. Now the ecological footprint is made up of carbon, built up land, fishing grounds, forests, grazing land, cropland and so on. And uh, each of them have different effects on uh, our ability to, su to survive. Uh, obviously, the carbon footprint at the moment is the greatest. And by the way, at the end of this graph, you can see that it comes down slightly, and that's as a result of the pandemic. So the rate of loss is increasing. Um, you know, if we don't pay our debts, then someone can come and take our house away. And this, so we're losing nature. We're losing, we've lost about 60% of nature in 50 years. And the rate of this loss is increasing. The science tells us, that, tells us that a fair distribution of resources would be equivalent to about 2.5 times the size of a football pitch per person. That's 2.5 global hectares. And global hectares is an average global land productivity. Uh, but the point is that developed countries consume more, and so they have more impact. I picture cities, for instance, as being like huge vacuum cleaners that are hoovering up resources from all over the world and nutrients from the soil in the form of food that we import, we eat it, and then it comes out in the form of sewage, in, for, in the form of pollution, <coughs> waste heat, and so on, and it becomes a problem. It's destroying our health and it's destroying our environment. In this graph, uh, the darker colors are uh, in the countries with the greatest footprint and the lighter colors, the pale yellows, these countries have on average the lowest footprint per person. And here in Wales, uh, the problem is um, that in fact we use 3.5 global hectares per person and if everybody in the world were to consume what we consume, we would need almost three planet Earths. This uh, map, by the way, is from a survey commissioned by the Welsh Government, which, uh, because of the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, has to commission these surveys of the ecological footprint of Wales every few years, and it's broken down into counties. And you'll notice, and perhaps be surprised, that uh, Powys and Ceredigion have the uh, highest ecological footprint, and I put that down to the fact that they're largely rural, the transport part of the footprint is very high, and also uh, the housing, the quality of the housing is, is worse, so uh, it's more spent on heating. Now, you may have uh, seen this graph before, uh, you may be familiar with Kate Rayworth, who wrote a book called um, the, uh, the donut, the, the donut economics, and she conceives the problem in this way. Um, the donut in question is a, a ring donut, is not 
a jam donut. And on the inside, pressing out, the pressures on the width of the donut are the things that we need to keep ourselves safe and within the um, requirements, more or less, of the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. And the things pressing inwards from the outside are the planetary boundaries, the pressures of the planetary boundaries. So it's crucial to keep in mind that there is nowhere in the world where the donut exists. In other words, where people are living well and genuinely sustainably at the same time. So this safe and just space for humanity is the space that we have to aim ourselves at. Otherwise, we risk catastrophe. And achieving One Planet success is the goal of the One Planet Centre. And there are other organisations, of course, driving to help communities reach the same space. Uh, but, they're not, but not all One Planet organisations or projects are necessarily using the ecological footprint. Mm -hmm. For instance, there's a project in Cardiff called uh, One Planet Cardiff, uh, developed by the council, but it makes no reference to the ecological footprint and it doesn't include the totality of the council's activities. Nevertheless, the Future Generations Act in Wales includes an aim to reduce the ecological footprint of Wales to one planet. Uh, the Act came into force in 2015 and other countries are learning from us. The ecological footprint captures more than the carbon footprint, as you saw in an earlier slide. It's very easy to communicate, but its disadvantage is that it can be difficult to capture data for. So at the One Planet Centre, we're developing ideas and learning from practice all over the world. Now I take inspiration from a 10 year old piece of planning legislation in Wales, which is called One Planet Development. In principle, these developments can be located anywhere, but in practice only so far in Wales have they been located in the open countryside. The planning conditions listed on the right hand slide of this slide are extremely rigorous. You can see that amongst them is uh, zero waste, 100% uh, renewable energy, but also to get your footprint down to nearly one planet per person. <clears throat> they tie the occupancy levels to the carrying capacity of the land and they give rise to beautiful, affordable, zero carbon homes and a significant increase in land productivity and biodiversity and they provide jobs. So I described how to go about One Planet Development in the book on the left which came out in 2015. And then while in charge of a website called Sustainable Cities Collective, which was for global leaders around the world, I began to think about how these principles could be applied at the city level. And that resulted in the second book on the right, which came out almost two years ago. And I began teaching about this and trying to persuade cities to take up the simple five step process to get to one planet success that's outlined in the conclusion of the book. The general approach is with, as with energy efficiency, what gets measured gets saved. The Welsh Government provides a calculator on its website to help people in one planet developments, and in fact anywhere, anybody can use it, uh, to get to one planet. It's freely available along with the planning guidance. So I started to wonder why all planning approvals and public purchasing decisions don't come with similar requirements. To me, it seems to be an obvious way to avoid unwanted, unsustainable development. So we've been working to apply these principles in practice. <clears throat> this is a list of some of the projects that we're engaged in at the moment, which I'm now going to go through one by one. So my nearest town is Swansea, and here with partners in that city, we're developing a solutions website, which will have solutions aimed at different audiences from the general public to councils and companies. And it will be published soon with the help of the Swansea Environment Forum and the support of the council. 
in the Swansea County area uh, as a whole, we came up with a one planet local development strategy for their rural development program, local action group. And they chose three strategic aims for the county, developing a distinctive identity around pride in a resilient community, reducing climate change and energy costs and strengthening the self-sufficiency of the local economy. Each of these aims had several objectives. So strategic aim one had objectives to increase biodiversity, to adopt organic ecological land management, incentivize locals and visitors to use zero or low carbon transport and develop a unique tourism offer that promotes the attractiveness of all of these things. And uh, strategic game two is about climate change and energy costs and uh, more uh, renewable energy, renewable heat, and to curtail emissions from buildings and strengthening the self-sufficiency of the local economy to move into a more self-sufficient uh, circular economy. Um, so we're just starting to test these ideas now in a larger area in Mid Wales. And we're working with an organization called Open New Town, and we're collecting data to calculate the ecological footprint and the biocapacity, but also consumption data. So much of this uh, data is available publicly. Um, we do, we're in that desk-based stage at the time, collecting this data. <clears throat> and from March onwards, then we'll be moving towards collecting data on the ground. And our data expert uses algorithms to adapt this data relative to planetary boundaries. And this will result in an ecological footprint for the Newtown area. So we will then hopefully <laughs> involve all sectors of the population to set goals to reduce the footprint to one planet over a specified period of time. And then after that, you can measure progress periodically to see if they're on track. We're also soon to launch a One Planet Standard. The aim of this is to help organisations to transform themselves to respect the planet Earth's natural boundaries and capacities. And we're working with an independent accreditation company and there will be bronze, silver and gold levels uh, and we will offer training and tools ourselves. It will be freely downloadable, but if people want to prove that they've achieved the level of the standard, then they will need to pay for the accreditation. So in summary, the methods that we recommend is that we should all set targets and measure progress over time. But it's extremely important to capture all activities, including imports and exports, to avoid unwanted consequences. For instance, although One Planet Cardiff and Cardiff Council has uh, used this campaign to tout all the wonderful things it's doing in Cardiff, it's still nevertheless permitting rather unsustainable activities to continue. So you need to capture absolutely everything for the whole picture in order to know whether we're really going to make the goals that we set ourselves. So capturing social and ecological value when you're making purchasing decisions is one way to do this. Uh, all decisions, in fact, whether based on procurement or planning decisions, we can capture this value. You may have noticed that the Das Gupta re review was published a couple of days ago. Um, it was commissioned by the Treasury and uh, it very much said that we are living beyond our means, uh, we have destroyed too much nature, we need to put it back and therefore we need to put a value on biodiversity and the way we can make this work for us is to actually account for it whenever we um, make any purchasing decisions. So we're contributing to the social value tool for Wales which uh, in order to, to add ecological value as well as social value and if we do that then we can um, hopefully work towards meeting all the goals of uh, sustainable development, which are social, ecological and economic. <clears throat> so the Welsh Wellbeing of Future Generations Act does mean all public money should be spent with the needs of wellbeing of future generations accounted for. So I think this might be one way to do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>